Okay, so Hanukkah, like the rabbi said, very special holiday, holiday that Jews from all over the world celebrate. But what exactly are we celebrating on Hanukkah? What are we celebrating? So the most basic form, we're celebrating two things. The first thing is we won the war. There's a big war over here. The Greek army was this huge army coming in, you know, demanding their, their way of life, forcing their way of life onto us. And there's one family who was willing to stand up for it. One family that was willing to stand up for the... Okay, so the, first, the, first, the basic thing is we won the war. And it was a serious war. It wasn't a very simple war over here, but the Hashemunayim stood up, you know, liot am chofshi to be a free nation in our own country, to live here based on our own belief. And that's exactly what they did. And miraculously, they won. It was, not, it was a long war. People don't know it. We grew up with the story of Hanukkah. It's a 52-year war. It was a long time, and there were a lot of casualties. It wasn't a simple war, but they won. And that itself was a miracle, because these people were not trained. It wasn't Tzahal. It wasn't top of the army. It was a family of Kohanim that the only knights they know is how to cut the, you know, the Shechita, maybe, or how to eat their korbanos. But that's it. They didn't know anything beyond that, and they were able to win. But then the second miracle is, they come to the Beis HaMikdash. Beis HaMikdash is totally destroyed. Everything is broken. They spend a few days cleaning it up, refurbishing it, and then they want to light the menorah, the golden menorah, the base of They can't find any gold. They can't find any any oil. So they look around. They're looking around. We all know they find a small jug with enough oil for one day, and miraculously, it stays lit for eight nights. Imagine you have uh, your phone, and it's got like twelve percent battery. And it lasts without charging it for eight days. Unbelievable. That is exactly the maze that the Hashanah, you know, if we're trying to read to understand what they felt, that's what they felt. I don't believe it. Without recharging it, the light is still going on. I can still enjoy it from the light of the menorah. There's an unbelievable maze. But the question is, and this is really what I want to discuss, is what was the war all about? Why did the Hashemunayim get up there and risk their life to fight against this big Greek army? The Greeks was the only Gullus, the only exile that we had, that they did not want to wipe us out. They weren't here to destroy the Jewish people. They didn't want to destroy the temple, the Beis HaMikdash. All they said is like, listen, wherever we go, we expect people to, to be good civilians, to be good citizens, and to take up on the customs of the Greeks. What's the big deal? Let us be Jewish with the, some customs of the Greek. You have to get up. You have to go ahead and fight against the Greeks. Risk your life. What was the war all about? In order to understand what the war was all about, we really have to try to understand the framework of Hanukkah. What is, where does Hanukkah fit in to our holiday system throughout the year? Right? We have a whole si- what The basic system of holidays, which is brought down in the Torah, is we have shalosh regalim. Shalosh regalim, each one is called a moed, and it starts with Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot. It's a process. You know, a moed comes from the word Beit Vad, or Ayad. You know, when you land in Elal, as you're landing, the airplane is landing, so then what does it say on the speaker? Ze'ata. Iganu el hayad. We have now reached our destination. Of course, in Israel, everyone claps their hand. It's very festive. We, we actually made it to Israel. And I think it's the only airline that everyone claps their hand. Because it's like we were expecting not to, but we made it. Okay. Okay, so we made it to Eretz Israel. We've reached our destination. So the word yad is the same word as moed. It's our destination. How do we normally reach our destination? With our raglayim with our regalim, which is the same word as regalim, you walk towards your destination with your feet, with your legs. So there's a process that we're trying to go through, and that's what the yearly cycle is all about. It starts with Passover, with Pesach, which is the holiday of freedom. We come out from our slavery, whether it's our own personal slavery, whether it's a national slavery, we're able to break free and start a process of connecting, of becoming our own individuals, so now we have we don't have any limitations to connect to the Almighty. And we count 50 days until we reach Shavuot. On Shavuot, now that we're free, we're a kli, we're a vessel to receive the wisdom, the Torah of God Almighty. 
And we're able to receive that wisdom. That comes on Shavuot. And we continue with that. Now that we have this wisdom, we learn it, we connect to it, and then we're able to go into the sukkah. The sukkah is really like you're in the house of Hashem. It's a hug from Hashem. That's why it's like the, the measurement of a sukkah is like two tefah, right? Two amos and a tefah. It's like a hug from Hashem. We're, it's called Tzelo de Nusa. We finally make it into Eretz Yisrael, into the land of Israel. That is our destination. Break free, receive the wisdom, connect to it, and now make it to the land of Israel. You are living in the house of the God Almighty. There was a glitch in the way. We did Chaita Egel, the sin of the golden calf. So Hashem said, if, once you sin along the way, so then we have to have a Yom Kippur, a day of atonement. Because the first Luchos were broken, so we need to have the 40 days of atonement. And on Yom Kippur, we get the second set of Luchos to make sure that we can keep on going on our destination, on our Yad, and reach the house of Hashem. And we have the day of judgment, Rosh Hashanah, in the, in the way before the Yom Kippur. That's part of that package. That is now a, a brief, we did it very, very quickly, a brief of our yearly cycle. And we go through this process on an individual basis and on a national level every single year. Going free, getting, receiving the Torah, and going into the house of Hashem. We're not perfect, there were glitches along the way, so we have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur to make sure that we can actually make it into the house of Hashem. That is the year. Where does Purim and Hanukkah fit into this system? We know that Purim and Hanukkah are not Torah holidays, rather they are rabbinic holidays. But they're not Stamina. They fit into the system. Where do they fit in? Shavuot. The ha it's my fault. Everyone please turn off your phone before the lecture. So that it doesn't disturb you. Okay. Did everybody turn off their phone? No. Where does Hanukkah and Purim fit into that yearly cycle? Now, it's so important. The Ramchal always tells us, you want to understand, you know, a lot of times, as Jews, we go through life, and we're doing different mitzvot, and we're focusing on what we need to do. It's sometimes important to take a step back and to see the general picture. When we're able to see the general picture, it gives us a little bit of a deeper understanding of what exactly are we doing? What is our purpose? Where are we heading to? So this is a little bit, very much in brief, the overview of what we go through as Jews through the yearly seven. But now let's try to understand where does Purim and Hanukkah fit in, the two Derabanan holidays. So let's start with Purim. Purim, we know there was sort of a default. There was something that wasn't perfect <laughs> A defect, something that wasn't perfect in the receiving of the Torah. And the Gemara tells us this in Megillah. Kafa Aleim Har Kegedis. A Kodesh Baruch Hu, God Almighty, sort of, sort of speak, forced us into receiving the Torah, receiving His wisdom at Mount Sinai. And He sort of picked up the mountain over us. And He said, if you receive the Torah, great. If not, I'm going to bury you right over here. The Mepharshim explained that it's not necessarily a literal that He picked up the mountain over us. But the revelation of God Almighty was so clear to us that we didn't have a Bechira, we didn't have any choice whether to take it or not. We were sort of forced into it. If you see something so clearly, so then you don't, you, in a way you lose your free choice whether you want to receive it or not. And the way God runs his world is that we're supposed to choose everything. We're supposed to choose him as our king. We're supposed to want something and we can't be forced into it. But the revelation was so massive that we were sort of coerced into it. That's what the Talmud tells us. And the Talmud tells us you should know. Modal Rabbala Raisin. We're making a big claim and a big statement. If you do not want to keep the Torah, so then maybe you, you were forced into it. Your ancestors were forced into it. We're talking about the Torah Shabbat Peh. Not the Torah Shabbat Peh. But you should know that as a nation, we re-accepted upon ourselves to keep the Torah. When did we do that? On Purim, Kimu v'kiblu aleim ayehudim, the Yehudim re-accepted the whole Torah upon themselves. It was a dark point. It was the time that they're going to be wiped out, but they did it me'ava. They did it out of love. The word Kimu v'kiblu kayam and kibel. It's like we accepted it before we even knew what it was. It's sort of like Nasa v'nishma. The Gemara makes a, uh, 
uh, reference between the two, Kibu the Kibu is like Nasa and Ishma, but today is not a share on Purim, but that's exactly what happened on Purim, we were forced into it, and then on Purim we accepted it out of love, so there was a little bit of a defect on Shavuot, and Purim is able to fix that. And therefore, it's part of our rabbinic holidays where the Jewish nation as a whole, as a nation, we accept it upon ourselves to go together with God out of love. But then there is one other thing that is sort of lacking from Shavuot. The Hanukkah comes to sort of give us the koach to continue, look, even though we're, we're missing something. What is that thing? The Talmud tells us, and it's already psukim in Parshas Vayishana, that the Jewish people, after they received the Torah at Mount Sinai, and again, when they received it, they heard it from the first two commandments, they heard from God Himself. The next eight commandments, they heard God Himself from the mouth of Moshe Rabbi. And they knew that the years following in the desert, if they have any question, they go to Moses, he's the man of God, Isha Lokim, we're going to ask him anything we want, everything will be clear. So then the Jewish people ask, what's going to be when we won't have Moses anymore? We're not going to have Moshe Rabbeinu. So then how are we going to know if we have any doubts? If we have anything that we're not so clear about, how will we know what to do? So Moshe Rabbeinu tells them, don't worry. God listened to your prayer, and he's going to give you a prophet, just like me. There will always be a prophet accompanying the Jewish people. And that's exactly how it was. There was time, and for many, many years, for centuries, there were prophets accompanying the Jewish people. 48 prophets that are well known to us, but the Talmud tells us that there were more prophets throughout the Jewish people, more than the amount of people that left Egypt. We're talking about millions and millions of prophets. You and I, we could have gone to the base of Mikdash and Simchas base of Shoeva. We would have gone this unbelievable prophetic, it was called the prophetic age, where everyone was able to connect to God. All of our doubts, right, that we might have, we didn't have it. We were able to connect to God. But there's going to come a time where that prophecy ends. What do we do then? We don't have prophets now. We have all these questions. We have all these doubts. How do we know that God is real? How do we know that this is what he wants us to do? What should we be doing? What is the purpose of life? Where, all of these deep questions. Why am I here? What should I be doing with my life? They had a prophet to tell them that. We don't have a prophet. So what should we do? That's exactly where Hanukkah comes in. And I'm going to explain. When, when we had prophets, it sounds so awesome, right? We had these prophets, but how come a lot of Jews didn't follow the prophets? And they went and they served idols. And they did all these terrible things. When you read the, you read the Tanakh, inside, it wasn't so simple. So we had all these prophets. If I had a prophet today, if Moses would come here, if your Yahweh Navi would come and will call out to the Jewish people, come on everybody, we're going to get together. Of course, it would be no question. Right? Now, all the Jews from around the world will make Aliyah, will build the base. It'll be amazing. That's, that's called Mashiach. That's what, that's what we're waiting for. But how come when they had those prophets, it wasn't so simple? Because there's a rule. The way God governs this world. There's always going to be an equilibrium between good and bad. There's always going to be an opportunity for us to choose between good or evil. It can't just be one-sided. If we had prophets, and that's all we had like nowadays, if we would have a prophet, everyone would run there. But in those days, when there were prophets, what was on the other side? A tremendous urge, a yetzer hara, for a vodazar, for idol worship. We don't understand what that means nowadays. We don't have that urge anymore. To us, it's silly. It bowed down to sticks and stones. I don't understand how that works. But in those days, it was, it was an unbelievable thing. Just to, to understand what it is, imagine there is like a window in heaven that connects this world and the world above. You could use this window for an unbelievable amount of energy. You could tap in, and anyone could, was able to do it. And that's why it was called the prophetic age. You were able to connect. You understood exactly what you're here for. You understood it. You could connect. You could go speak to the prophet. That window was open. And what did the prophets always say? Ko amar Hashem. This is the word of Hashem. We knew it very, very clearly. But when that window was open, you could tap into that power and bring down sort of koho satoma. That was the Nidhiyei Sheker. And they put in a certain energy into the wood and stone 
And then people were, were drawn to it. There was a spiritual ecstasy. Wow, I want to run. Right? They want to tell us about King Menashe, that he lifted up his cloak to run to it. He said that you, one of the Amram, you wouldn't pick up your cloak to run to it. Him, he was already dignified. He didn't run to Davut. But there was a tremendous urge to run after the Abu Dazar because there was like a spiritual ecstasy that people felt with this Abu Dazar. But what happened? There was Yerida Sadoros. There was the de uh, declining of the generation. If I ask you, electricity, is that a good energy or a bad energy? Tons of electricity. Is that good or bad? Depends how you use it. A little bit of electricity, I can plug my iPhone, even though my iPhone is only four. But still, I can still use it to plug my iPhone, right? I'm not up to date, but it still works. If my little kid sticks his fork in the socket, he's going to get a shock. He's going to run to mommy. He's going to say, ah, look what happened to me. His mommy's going to scream at him. And then Abba's going to come and have to calm him down. And I'm going to scream at him, right? Because it's going to be the whole chinuch thing. But at the end of the day, if it's misused by a child, it can hurt him. What if there's a lot of electricity? A power plant. It can power the whole entire city. Amazing. But what happens over there if one of the workers touches the live wire? He's fried on the spot. The more power we have, if we use it properly, a tremendous amount of koach we can use. If we misuse it, the damage is going to be so much greater. When this window is open between heaven and earth, tremendous amount of electricity. You can connect and have so much power and understand things so clearly. But if you misuse it, bam. Avodah Zara. Chayv Misa. Destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. And that's why the rabbis recognized that we were becoming like children. And you don't give such a strong, powerful tool to a child. If I have a chainsaw, it's a tremendous tool. I can build something with it. I can cut heavy wood with it. I can do a tremendous amount of things. But what happens if I give it to a child? It's dangerous. It's true, he might be able to use it properly, but he might also misuse it and hurt himself. The rabbis of that generation recognized that keeping this window open is like giving a chainsaw to a child. And we must close this window between heaven and earth. It's true, we have Nevoa, we have tremendous amount of electricity, but too many kids are touching the live wire and are falling to Avodah Zara. There's Yerida Sadoros. We must pray for that window to be shut. And that's what happened in that generation. That generation, Anshik Nesesagdola, the Talmud tells us about exactly how it happened. They got together and they prayed, please remove the Yetzirah for Avodah Zara. And the uh, Basco came down, he got a note from heaven that their tefillah was accepted, and a pillar of fire came out of Kodesh HaKodashim, because obviously the Yetzir Har of Avodah Zarah dwells right in the place that's the holiest of holies, because that's exactly the same energy, depends how you tap into it, and it leaves Kodesh HaKodashim. And that, the Gemara continues, it's not our topic, but the Gemara over there continues, they saw they had such good fortune with their request, they said, please remove the desire for inappropriate relationships, for alayot. And they, and they got an okay from heaven. But you know what happened? The earth went cold for three days. The chickens didn't lay their eggs. There was no warmth in the world. There was no desire. And they realized the world is not going to continue if we don't have a desire to procreate. So therefore, they requested it, please have a person have a bad desire only for his wife. And in heaven, they wrote them back a note. You can't have half a desire. Either you have it or you don't have it. Right? And that's exactly what happened. But they said, okay, but we, there won't be a desire for immediate relationship, for, for sisters, for parents. That they were able to remove. But that, that's the end of that Gemara over there. We know that the day, and according to the Rama, it's very interesting. The Rama brings down, there's still uh, an old Yemenite community that does this. We, we know that we're now in year Tafshin Ayin Vav. There are certain communities that used to count the years from the rule of Alexander the Great. And the Rambam explains, it's brought down in Seder Olam, Olam Rabbah, that the day the last prophet was Nifter, Malachi was Nifter, that's the day that Alexander the Great rose to power. Meaning, the day that we lost this prophecy, that we no longer have this window, 
that now there is something lacking about Shavuot. We do not have a clear relationship to Mount Sinai anymore because we don't have a prophet like we had for throughout so many years, throughout so many centuries. So we're missing something on Shavuot. We don't have that prophecy anymore. On that day that we lost the prophecy, who rises to power? The Greeks. Alexander the Great, which was the, first, the beginning of the Greek Empire. And he starts to spread that culture throughout the world. Before that time, that world was a pagan world. And that's why our modern history, when we learn modern history in school, where does it start? It starts from the Greeks, from Aristotle, from Socrates, from Alexander the Great, because that is modern civilization. Beforehand, it was a prophetic age. It was the time that we were able to connect to God through Nebua, and the rest of the world was a pagan world that served idols. But now that window is closed, people are not starting to serve idols anymore. We need to find some culture. We need to find some science and some philosophy. It's a whole new world that is spreading onto world history and also onto Jewish history. Because now for the first time, we don't have Nevoah anymore, but rather, what do we have? We have the Chachamim. If you look at the Mishnais and Perkei Avos, the first Mishnah is, Anshei Knesset Agdol, Heimon Ushlo Shadvar. What's the second Mishnah? Shimon HaTzadik, Hayom Yishayari Knesset Agdol. Shimon HaTzadik was from the remnant of Anshei Knesset Agdol, meaning he sat there in the men of the Great Assembly, 120 men, he saw prophets with his own eyes, he himself was not a prophet, but he was a man de Amar. For the first time in Jewish history, we have somebody saying, Ashita, Shimon HaTzadik Haya Omer. He used to say something. How can we never have Yirmiyahu Hanavi Omer? David HaMelech Omer, Shlomo HaMelech Omer? Because they never said their own shah. What did they say? They said, Ko Amar Hashem. This is what Hashem said. This is the wisdom of Hashem. Because we had the Nebuah, the connection back to Sinai. But now for the first time, we don't have it. We have a man de Omer. We have the Chacham. We have the wisdom of the Greeks versus the wisdom of the rabbis. We have that equilibrium continues for us to choose where are we going to go. Beforehand, we had an equilibrium. Do we want the idol worship or do we want to follow the prophets? Now, do we want the science and the culture of the Greeks or do we want to follow what the rabbis say? Shimon Atzali. It's very interesting. Shimon Atzali, which is the first time in Pirkei Avos, so we know that the Talmud tells us the story how he met Alexander the Great. You see that it's Mamish in the same time period. Alexander was coming and taking, conquering over the whole world. He was going to come and overtake Yerushalayim and destroy it. And so Shimon Atzali puts on his, his big, big Kohen Gadol. He walks out towards him with two rabbis on either side with torches. They're walking all night. And when Alexander the Great finally meets him, so it says that he got off, off his horse and he went down and bowed down to him. Why well, bowed down to this filthy Jew? Said his messenger. Said the guy next to him. So he says, you don't understand when I go to battle. I see Shimon Atzadik. I see his image in my dreams. I know I'm going to win. There's a connection right up there. The next mission of Imperios is Antignos, Ish Silko, Antignos. That's a Greek name. There's already the Greek influence on the Jewish people because Shimon Atzadik was able to convince Alexander the Great, don't conquer Yushalayim. You can stay here, but don't, don't conquer us. And Alexander respected the Jews. There's wisdom over here. There's, there's uh, intelligence. Look at their rabbis. This is something that, this is a culture that I value. Antiknos Ishsoka, he's already info, he's got the Greek name. And now that the Torah is no longer Ko Amar Hashem, it's up to the interpretation and the explanation of the rabbis, we for the first time have different sects within Judaism. Because who were the two students of Antiknos Ishsoka? Sadok and Baitos. Sadok and Baitos is the first sect that is breaking away within Judaism. The Tzdukim and the Baitusin. Because they're saying, oh, if you're explaining the Gemara that way, I got my own way to explain it. I'll explain the wisdom of the God Almighty in my own interpretation. This is the way I understand it. And this is the way you understand it. And then the Mishnah continues. The Yeshua ben Prachi over there, and, and uh, Nitai Arveli, the second Mishnah over there is, is right away referring to the first Machlokas we have within Judaism. We never had a Machlokas before. Because everything was called Amar Hashem. Now we have a Machlokas. There was one Machlokas over there, and Yeshua ben Prachi already, his Talmud, started Christianity. We already have sects breaking off of Judaism and starting different religions. 
Because now there's no longer the clear connection back to Sinai. And if we don't have the clear connection back to Sinai, we're lacking something in our yearly cycle. But that is exactly where Hanukkah comes in. That is what the Hashmonaim stood up and were willing to fight. Because in the beginning, it was just the Greeks were around. There was beautiful Greek culture. Why not? They're wise. We're wise. We value their culture. It's great. Let's all get along. It's going to be great. But eventually, the Jewish people were so enamored by those lights. Wow. The stadiums and the gladiators and, and the culture and the philosophy. It's so amazing. And eventually, not only were Jews starting to be more and more like the Greeks, but the Greeks were starting to force it upon us. You can't keep Shabbos anymore. You can't have a bris mila. You can't have a rosh chodesh. They're starting to deny. What are they picking these, these specific mitzvahs? What do they care about? It? Because they were bothered by something. There's something that is different between their culture and our culture. The Greeks worshipped beauty. It was amazing for them. Wow, the physical body. It has to be perfect. The philosophy, the understanding. They, were, they, were, they loved it. They loved that culture. And they saw the Jewish people also loved it. But there's something that bothered them about the Jewish people. Because we saw the beauty in holiness. While they saw holiness in beauty. That was the difference. If you take the letters Yava, Yud, Vav, Nun, Sophis. Beautiful letters, very symmetric, three straight lines. It looks a little bit like our cell phones. Maybe that's a hint about our cell phones, right? Do I have enough energy? Am I fully yabam, right? <laughs> you think about it like that, if you turn it around, okay? So we got the yud, I just thought about that, right? We got the yud, <laughs> the vav, and the, and the nun, so really beautiful letters, really symmetrical, but it's the only letters in the Jewish alphabet that don't have a panemius. There's no inside to them. They're just they're very straight. And olive, it's got it's got some meat to it. It's got thickness to it. Yud vav nun very 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 flat. Very it looks beautiful, but it's only beautiful on the outside. There's one letter in the Hebrew alphabet that represents righteousness. A tzaddik. Which letter is that? A tzaddik. Right. The name of the letter it represents that that element. A tzaddik is like a tzaddik. If you take the letter tzaddik and you put it in front of the word yud vav nun, what does it spell out? Seal. The Jewish people, we value beauty as well. But what do we put in front of it? The righteousness. That is the beauty of Yerushalayim. Ten measures of beauty came down to the world. Nine took Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim is a beautiful city, but so is Greek. So is Rome. There's a lot of beautiful cities all around the world. But in Yerushalayim, the beauty is because we're able to connect the physical and the spiritual beauty into one. We're able to turn it into one thing. And we were, we were willing to stand up to fight for that. Because that's what Yerushalayim represents. If you look around, go to the Israel Museum, go to any museum that has Jewish art. So it's not that we don't value art. There were Jews that were tremendous marksmen. They were able to do the most unbelievable things. But what is Jewish art all about? If you look at the museum, what is the art pieces? What are, what are they? It's normally a beautiful Esro box. It's a beautiful painting that was on the wall of a shul. It's a beautiful case for a mitzvah, for a commandment. Meaning we take the art and we take that beauty and we use it as a vessel to elevate the spiritual connection. We value the beauty. The emos were beautiful. But it has to be with Yira Sashem. And that's what they were willing to fight for. If we look in our tefillah, we say, What did they want to do? This Malchus Yavon, the kingdom of Yavon, stood up to do what? Lehashkicham Torah they stood up to make us forget our Torah. How can you make somebody forget their Torah? If I have a, if there's a war that breaks out, and we have a special family uh, message, or we have a special code where we keep our family treasures, and some, somebody tells his child, you have to remember this code. 
never forget it. So then the child is going to remember. And if people tell us, you have to forget, you have to forget, you have to forget. Everyone, I want everyone to forget about the big white elephant in this room. Just forget about it. Don't think about it at all, ever. <laughs> right? So then everybody's starting to think about, the, you, how can you actively forget, make someone forget? But if you look at what the Torah, what the Sphila says, it says, Kishi'am the Mach was Yom and Arisha, Lashkicham. It doesn't say Lashkicham es ha Torah. It says Lashkicham Torah secha. To make the Jewish people forget that this is your Torah. In fact, the Greeks wanted to translate the Torah into 70 languages. They wanted, this is an unbelievable wisdom. We want this to be the best seller in all time's history. And they were able to accomplish that. It did become the best seller in world history. It's the Bible, right? But at the end of the day, what did they want the Bible to be? If everyone's got the Bible, so then it's not the Jewish Bible anymore. Then it has no inner connection to the Torah. It has no connection. That, those were the three mitzvahs that they went out to fight against us. Bris Mila. Oh, you think your body is holy? You have to sanctify it. Take a baby and make his body holier by a bris milah? We're against that. It's got to be just the physical beauty. You want to take Shabbos? Shabbos, you, you want to say that there's one day more holy than the other days? You want to tell me that there's Kedusha in Zman when a certain time period comes in? There's a special holiness? We don't believe in that. There's no connection. There is no holiness. There's just wisdom. There's culture. There's philosophy. We're Shkodesh is the Kedusha of the Makkum, because with Rosh Chodesh you can only be Mekadosh Rosh in the Beis HaMikdash. And Rosh Chodesh allowed people to do Aliyah L'Regal, to, to come to the Holy Place. That's why they didn't destroy the Beis HaMikdash. Because they love culture. Let's keep it as a museum. Let, let people come in and see what it's all about. But we have to have an idol in here. We have to make a lot of breaks. There's no separation between Jews and non-Jews. Everybody should be... T this is a beautiful cultural place, but there's no connection between this world and the world. And, and for that, the Hashemonaim were willing to get up and to fight. And it wasn't an easy fight. It was one of the darkest times of Jewish history. In fact, Yavon is called Choshech. It's called darkness. The Choshech al Pinei home. The second Pasuk in the Torah says, the Medrash Rishlakish brings us down, that this is Yavon that brought down a darkness onto this world because we had a, a prophetic age before that and now we're in an age where it's all about wisdom, my wisdom versus their wisdom. And this is what the Hashemunah were willing to fight about. And it wasn't an easy battle. And I want to tell you something that gave them the koach. There's something that's very, very special in the mitzvah of Neros Hanukkah that we don't have in any other mitzvah. If somebody is traveling, or if somebody is Hashem, a homeless, he doesn't have a place to light. We know that the mitzvah that we light, we light as a family. There's a mitzvah, Ner Ish Uveso. The mitzvah is on the home, is on the family. And that's why if you don't have a home, so then you don't like. It's specifically on the home because the Greeks tried to undo the Jewish family. They tried to breach it. They tried to break it. You weren't allowed to go to the mikvah. You weren't allowed to have bris milah. If a girl wanted to get married, she had to go to the egmo tchila. Anything that had to do with the Jewish kedusha, with the holiness in our, again, that same concept. They want, this is just a physical related. This is just... You know, this is an agreement. There's no holiness in this relationship. They wanted to destroy it. That's why we do it as a family. Every family lights their candle. But there's something special. If somebody does not have a home, or somebody is traveling, and he doesn't light the menorah, so then what should you do? There's one, there's a bracha that the Gemara brings down. I don't think we're knowing it nowadays. I think the tour brings down that we're not knowing this bracha nowadays. But it's called Birkat Haroe. The bracha of somebody who sees. If you're traveling and you don't have a place to light, but you see somebody else's light, you can stop and make a bracha because you saw his light. Where do we ever find that in Judaism? If I don't have any matzah, but I see somebody munching away on matzah, I'm allowed to make a bracha? Allah filas matzah? He's eating it. He's the one who lit it. What, what type of bracha is it? No, it's lahadlik now. You have to light the candle. How come you're making a bracha because you're seeing somebody else's light? The before should explain that there's something, we see this, with candles of Hanukkah, there's something unique to seeing the candles. We don't have permission to use them, rather to look at them. What's so special about looking at the candles? 
Because in life, and listen to this good, in life, you could take away from somebody almost anything besides their Bechira, their choice, how they choose to look at the situation that they are in right now. You could take away almost anything from them. But it's their choice to decide how do they want to look at this difficult situation that I'm in. The Hashmonaim were in the most difficult situation imaginable. A huge Greek army to get up and fight against them is suicide. It was a suicide mission. Well, how can we get away there? But they were able to look at the situation and to understand if we don't get up and fight for what it means to be a Jew, so then there won't be any Jews to fight for anymore. We, there just won't be the continuity of the Jewish people. We'll all just be like the same thing. It'll be one big melting pot and everybody will be, the, there will be nothing unique about the Jewish people. They were able to look at it in a different light. This past week, a week and a half ago, I went to a wedding on Thursday night. The wedding of Sarah Tichya and Ariel. I wasn't the only one who went to that one. There was a lot of people who went to that one. But for me, personally, that wedding was extremely, extremely inspirational. You know, normally you write on the invitation, you write, Kol Sason, Kol Simcha, Kol Chatan, Kol Kala. That's what you normally write on the invitation. We all know her story. Her father and her brother were traveling to the Shabbat Chatan of her wedding. And they got killed by terrorists on the way to the wedding. So instead, the day of her wedding, she has to be sitting ship. But she decides to invite the entire Jewish people to her wedding. For her, it was the darkest point. It was, it was supposed to be the happiest week, and it became the saddest week, the, the, the most darkest point in her life. And she could have looked at it in so many different ways. She could have been in the darkness and in the misery. But she decides to look at it in a totally different light. I'm going to use this opportunity to let people be mechazik me. To be an inspiration onto myself. And you know, to be an inspiration onto other people. Because the people who came to that wedding, they weren't just, they were coming to inspire them. But we, we were also coming to inspire ourselves. Because we want to feel a part. We, we want to be no all. We want to be there for them. She wrote on her invitation, Do not rejoice, my enemies. Hashem or Ali. If I fell, I'm going to get up again. And if I'm sitting in the darkness, God Almighty is my light. That was her wedding invitation. And I came in there, and I remember it. I came in there with my father and my two brothers. And we walked in, and you know, somebody recognized my father. So he put us into like the inner circle over there. It was Rabbi Mar, and this, and people are dancing, and the chas and the kala are sitting there. And I'm hearing uh, Avram Fri is singing his song. I don't know, that I still haven't found the source for this song. Maybe it's just a nice song. And he said, and the words of the song, I remember it, because I'm looking at the chas and kala. And he's singing songs that, that says like this. Ribono shalom ani yodea, shebet ha-mikdash ha-shlishi, Eno banui me'avanim, ela mitma'ot. God Almighty, I know that the third temple is not built from stones, rather from tears. V'im kol ma sh'ata tzarich hi rak dima achat, v'vakasha kach et sheni. And if all you need is one tear, please take mine. That was the song, and everyone was rejoicing. And I see the kala. She's rejoicing and she's crying. She's crying and she's rejoicing. And she didn't have just one tear. She had a lot of tears. And she's saying, she's not saying, I'm upset. She's saying, Take my tear and rebuild the base of English. And that's what everybody was thinking. That is taking the darkest situation and rebuilding it. Rebuilding it and seeing the, the light within the darkness. And I noticed that within that circle of the people dancing in front of the Chassan and Kal, who came to be the Sameach, the Chassan and Kal? Who came to rejoice with them? There was a Jew. His name is David Chatuel. David Chatuel lost his wife and four children. 
he was his wife was pregnant and he had four daughters and they were driving he wasn't there he was in school at the time because he was a principal and they were driving in Gush Katif and they were all gunned down but you know what he did he was it was a difficult time the most difficult time but he was able to regroup he got remarried he had a child a boy and then he had a girl and he came to rejoice with this chasam and to show them I know you went through the darkest time, but when the sun sets, the sun is going to rise again. That week's parasha was Yaakov leaving Eretz Yisrael. When Yaakov left Eretz Yisrael, it says, Batishka lo Hashemesh. The sun went down for him, and he slept in that place. It became a point of darkness for him. He was leaving Eretz Yisrael. Esau is chasing him. Eliphaz took all of his clothes, all of his money. He's got nothing left. What's he asking for? Hashem, please take the lead. Lechem lecho, ubeg in lilbosh. Just something to eat and something to wear. He had nothing. He's in the darkest point of his life. But he gets up and he goes to Lavan's house. And it's difficult. And he builds Klal so and he comes back, says, The Medrash, Vatizrach lo Hashemesh. The same son that went down for him. Vatizrach lo Hashemesh. After he was able to overcome Esau and to make it back to Israel. David Chatuel came to rejoice. To tell him, you could do it. You could come out of the darkness and see the light. Hanukkah is that time that gives us that koach, gives us that energy. It doesn't matter how difficult the person situation is, it, whether he's in a financial difficulty, whether it, he's looking for a shidduch, whether he's, he's got child bias issues, whether it's children issues, whatever the situation might be. And we feel like, oh no, ki yeshev b'choshech. Hashem worthy. We're able to see the light within the dark. It's specifically Hanukkah that gives us that opportunity. That, that's what the Hashemunayim taught us. They taught us that it doesn't matter that the window closed. And now that we don't have that prophetic age, and now we're fighting, and there's a assimilation that is beginning for the first time in Jewish history, there's assimilation, there's a Nisiyabli, because we don't have a Nebu anymore. In the time of the first base, when they did have Odazar, they still knew that there was a Rebbe Moshalom. Now there's assimilation for the first time. But they say, we're going to be, we're going to fight it. We're going to see the light from the darkness. We're going to... The Tamidei Chachamim, the Torah, the wisdom that the, that the Torah has for us. And then this whole time period turns into a time of Lehodos Ulehav. Lehodos Ulehav, to praise Hashem, to glorify Hashem. What's Lehodot? Lehodot in its simplest form is just to say Toda. You know, the, the heroes of this story, Yehuda Maccabi, Yehudit. We are called Yehudim. All comes from the word Lehodot. But it's very interesting, in Hebrew, in Lashon HaKodesh, the word Hoda'ah has two explanations. There's Hoda'ah, ni modeh lecha. I say thank you to you, but there's another Hoda'ah that's called Hoda'at Baldin. I admit, ani modeh she. I admit that I did something. And it's not sound that these two words have one, they, they're the same word but two different meanings. Because you know, sometimes it's very difficult for people to say thank you. Why is it difficult for people to say thank you? To say thank you to our wives, to say thank you to our parents, to our close friends. Why is it so difficult to say thank you? Because a real thank you first comes with a oda'a. Ani modeh she, I have to admit that I need you, my wife. I have to admit that I need you, my kids, that I need you, my friends. No one wants to admit that we need somebody else. It makes us weak. But a real thank you is first saying, ani modeh she, I admit that I need you. And now I lecha. Now I'm saying thank you to you that you were there for me. Hanukkah is the time that we admit that we needed God's help, and we were able to see that. Because if it, if it's up to us, so then there's no way we're gonna get out of the darkness. If it's up to us just by ourselves, we're not gonna be able to do. It. But Gam ki Hashem b'choshech, Hashem orli. God Almighty will be my light. And now if God Almighty is gonna help me out, so then I can do it. I can do it and I admit that I need your help. And now I want to thank you for all the beautiful things that you've helped me. And the halal means that's the hodos and the halal is, is to spread it out. If we were given a gift and we found there's something good in our life, so we have to be mefars in the nace. The hala. You know, this menorah has got eight uh, lights on it. The menorah and the base of Mikdash, how many candles did it have? Seven. Seven. The mikubal t- tell us, and this is very interesting. That our face is just like the menorah in the base of Mikdash. How is that? We got two ears, we got two eyes, two nostrils, and one mouth. 
There's seven openings in our face, similar and parallel to the menorah of the Beis Hamikdash. Why? Because with our face, we can do exactly what the menorah of the Beis Hamikdash did. Le'ayil panim, to lighten up somebody's day. You say a good word. You had something good to you, so say say a good word to somebody else. Say thank you to somebody else. Be excited with them, then they're going to light up. And you know what? A smile is just like a candle. Because if I have a candle and I give it to you and, and you give it to her and to him and to this, everybody's going to have that candle and I don't lose at all from my flame. You can pass one flame to the next and to the next and everyone, it, it just multiplies and the original flame does not lose from its light. The same thing with a smile. Try it. Give somebody a really good smile. It's contagious. They're going to smile. I see you smiling, right? They're going to smile and then other people are going to smile, and uh-huh. it passes up. That's called la ear pani. This is what Hanukkah is all about. Hanukkah, the war was to fight, are we going, yes, we value beauty. We value this world. We value it, but it needs to be with a connection. A connection to the world above. And that's why it's eight, which is l'malam in the teva. We want to go above the teva. Seven is the physical world. Eight is above the physical world. We want to be connected on top of the physical world. What connects? Number seven is the physical world. Number eight is above the physical world. What number will be the connecting number between seven and eight? What's the middle between seven and eight? 7.5. So if you want to take it into the bigger, it would be 75. The gematria of Kohen is 75. It's the Kohanim that connect the physical and the spiritual world together. It happens in the base of English, the Hashmonam or Kohanim. They're connecting the two worlds together. That's, that's why it's called Shemon. I mean, Shemon, and that's why we eat a lot of oil. And Shemon goes up to the, it makes us more Shemon. Because we're eating, it shows that it's above. It rises to the top. But that's also the word Neshama is the same letters as Shemon. It's the inside. It's the spiritual world. That is what Hanukkah is all about. They wanted to destroy any connection to the spiritual world. They're saying everything is here. Physical beauty, gladiators, stadiums. It's all about here. It's all about what this world has to offer. And the Hashmonayim, the Kohanim say, no, our job is to connect this world and the world above. For that, they were willing to risk their life. Because if you don't know what you're willing to die for, you don't even know why you began to live, what your life is about. They knew what their life was about. So they were willing to die for it. And it was mysterious Nefesh. And they got up there, and they fought for it, and they were able to be matzliach, and it was the darkest point in their life, but they were able to see it. They were able to see the light within the darkness. May we be zocha as well, to see the light within the darkness, within our own personal life, within our own national life. We're in a difficult time, whether it's personally, but definitely on, on a national level, in our job, and what the Hanukkah, the Koach of Hanukkah, tonight is the first night, it's going to, holach, mosef the holach, like they will say, the light is going to just keep on increasing from tonight on. And we're going to be zocha to or chadash al tzion tar to a new light onto Yerushalayim. The nizke kulanu b'meir la'orah. May we all see it soon in our times. Thank you very much. Hi, Hasanah.